Western media outlets where they once were. Where are we in terms of peak? I think they peaked about 10 to 15 years ago. Communism collapsed with the Berlin Wall and all that. And the only civilization that exists in the world that are actually competing with the Western culture on a moral front is the Islamic culture. And what is the core state of the Islamic culture? Saudi, Saudi Arabia. What's the definition of a society? A set of people who believe in a core values that would define what is good and what is bad. Look at the United States. Do you think that they agree on core values? Not today. Not today. I can't help but think that us shaking hands with our Iranian neighbors a few weeks ago, I can't imagine that that was news that the Americans wanted to see. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Welcome to a new episode of the Mo Show podcast with Mr. Zaid Tamimi. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. Before we started shooting, you asked me a question that many people asked me. You said, Mo, why did you think of this show? But the reason why I started this show is because I was unsatisfied with how Western media was portraying our country. I thought the disparities were huge. I thought it was unfair. I thought it was unjust. And honestly, I also saw how people gravitated towards Rogan. And then I started looking into decentralized media or independent media. I'm like, that's one guy. Mm -hmm. And institutions, mass, not mass media, but yeah, corporate news channels are going at him. You're talking about a building with 40 floors of employees are going against Joe Rogan. There's a lot of power in that one person in decentralized media. So I was like, why not? In order to formulate a question from all of that is, how would you say Western media has influenced the world to the point where I felt the need to start this and to the point of really reaching global dominance in the world of media? The way that I would say from a communication perspective, they succeeded because most of their narrative is based on three pillars. The first one is rights. Whenever you would tune into any or most of the narrative that produced in the Western culture, it would talk about rights, which you are entitled to as an individual. And they built those rights in a very universal way that would, be, that would make it uh, uh, appealing to everyone around the world. So anyone at the receiving end would engage. They're not talking about them. They're actually talking about me and what am I entitled to. Hence, you would find everyone engaged. Look at the other cultures. Are they doing the same? No, everyone is actually talking about themselves. They're not talking about others. So they're talking. Uh, so this is one of the main pillars that, that made them really grab the attention of the rest of the world. The second pillar is dialogue. It's not one unifying narrative, i.e. that the Western nations are telling you a certain thing and this is the right thing to do. They do sometimes, but mostly it's a dialogue. You have different ideas collide with each other trying to come up with a new conclusion. Again, to the receiving end, that's very appealing. You can find a lot of good speeches that are mesmerizing a lot of people, but mostly every debate or dialogue would make the audience engage even more. So that's the second pillar. It's a dialogue where the uh, uh, audience at the receiving end would feel that they are actually invited to participate and they feel that they can go and say whatever they wanna say. The third pillar is, I call it opportunity. There's always call to action and all the messages that they're, or all the achievements that they do. Putting man on the moon, NASA, you can be part of it. You could come, you could be an immigrant and, and be there. So again, whatever that I see producing their own narrative, me as, as an audience, I can see myself there and I can relate. And that, those are the three pillars that made them significantly successful. There's a few political backgrounds you know, going through the Cold War and they have to defeat the, the other ideology and they have to build this narrative the political elites, they were fully aligned with the, uh, with, the, with the media production and universal values that would appeal to all because they were actually really trying to crowd out the other ideology. So back to those three pillars, talking about rights, um, talking, uh, present their own ideas in a dialogue, and always there's an opportunity and call to action to everyone around the world. That's why they succeeded. So it was tactical. 
Um, it's not really tactical. So I'm, I'm talking about right now, like the main pillars from a strategic perspective. This is what allowed them to penetrate every culture. If you build your narrative based on those three pillars, you would penetrate any culture. So that's that's why they succeed. And look at all the other narratives that exist around the world. None of them, and I mean none of them, would have those three pillars. So this is why they became extremely, extremely successful. I'm looking back, I don't know, World War II, the Nazi era. Okay. Um, I know it's, it's, it's a topic that you know not many people want to touch on, but um, allow me to mm-hmm. formulate a question on it. Would you say that they got a head start by by portraying propaganda messaging through through that era? Is that when it really started? They did borrow a lot of things. Um, let's talk about the Nazis for a second. The communication model that existed back then is one to many. It's one radio station. You're not allowed by the Nazi to listen to any other narrative. So the government actually did control the narrative. One single narrative to everyone. So you literally, to a certain extent, if there's only one narrative, you can actually shape reality by shaping perception. What the Western culture, specifically the Americans, they did not follow the Nazi, let's say, communication model. So we shifted from one to many to actually few to many. There's a, let's say, free media outlets that exist within, let's say, the United States. So people have different re- uh, uh, source of information that they can tune to and, and compare whatever that they would agree with. And a lot of institutions w- would, would compete on their uh, um, credibility. So what the American, and, I, and I'm talking about the American mostly when I talk about the Western uh, um, civilization, because they are the core state, hence they are influencing anyone. So I'm going to take a lot of most of my examples from the United States. So what they did, they did not control a narrative and they did not say to their own citizens, you only should listen to one narrative. They said, what they did is that they controlled the dialogue itself. Mm. We have a very limited capacity as a human. We have a very limited exposure. So they could overwhelm us easily, especially with the mass production that they have right now. So what they did is that they controlled the dialogue. Certain topics, certain capacity, you cannot talk about certain things simultaneously. So this is how they control uh, uh, media in general by following the model few uh, too many. Now we're moving into the uh, internet era. Complexity. Is hands, hands, of, hands in many. <laughs> so now we move into many to many. So the level of complexity is enormous. You have to use AI actually to control it and, and specific algorithms. So I don't think there's any form of control right now. Or if I would call it a control, I would call it very chaotic control. States are really struggling to control. There's a lot of legislation being introduced. They're trying to catch up, but it's very chaotic right now to control uh, uh, media in general. So moving back to your questions, did the Nazi help? Yes, to a certain extent, from one to many. We moved from few to many, and then many to many, and I think we've lost control there um, um, completely. So they did use it, but they actually evolved to a certain extent that right now we're losing control. If you own a corporate news channel on the verge of the internet boom and, and, and now how everyone is a journalist, you know, I've seen some journalists have more followers on Twitter than the companies they work for. True. Are you worried if, if you're a corporate news channel agency that in 10, 20 years, where am I going to be? It's all about sustainability. As an individual, it's very hard to build a sustainable let's say, a uh, media outlet, you're going to fail eventually. We've seen this not on journalists, we've seen this on influencers, how they, they really thrived in the first, uh, first two years and then they collapsed. It's an institutional work. You can survive by bringing a different perspective, let's say, as an individual. Media is democratized right now. Bring a mic, just like we do right now, yeah. a few cameras here and there, and you can talk to the whole world. And, uh, um, but again, What's your perspective as an individual? You're going to run out on your own perspective. If you don't have dynamics that would feed you and let you know about what the heck is going on in the world and how you can engage, it's very tough for you to survive as, a, as, a, as an individual. Eventually, you're going to have to find the institutions. And there are a lot of, I mean, barriers for us as an individual. How would you sustain this as a business? You need a lot of sponsorships. You need ownerships. You need a lot of regulations to follow for the government. And there's a flag. Maybe people will not like you, and 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 uh, become a target. 
Yes, th those are five filters that Noam Chomsky talked about. I think people can actually Google that and find. It's not really easy to to uh, to survive there as a, as a as an individual, but it's possible with low momentum. You could you could survive, and we've seen this. You started as an individual, and you have to turn yourself into an institution in order to survive. Yeah, I want to know about Edward Bernays. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. <laughs> I googled him. Uh, I wanted to know more about him. And sure. the best way I think for me to sum up who on earth he is. Uh, I want to say Mr. PR. He was the beginning of it all, was he? He was the godfather of PR. The godfather of PR. Okay. He started actually PR. Well, he has a very interesting story. And I've done my research about him when I was in college. His uncle is Sigmund Freud, a famous psychologist. Mm -hmm. Psychologist who doesn't trust masses, who believe that masses actually are driven by their own intrinsic hedonistic desires. Goodness. So it's not about rationality. And he lived in First World War uh, and the Second World War, and, and he lost trust in masses and he could not trust. Them. So Edward Bernays, his nephew, was heavily influenced by his uncle. And he said, one of his arguments is, is actually, we cannot trust those masses because they are actually irrational. Um, we need to communicate using irrational, i.e. use emotions, social appeal, and not talking about real, uh, functional, tangible, uh, thing. And a lot of philosophers, such as Walter Lippmann, actually did agree with him that we cannot really control masses. Um, if they're not educated and they don't have the level of knowledge that they, they're supposed to have, and how do you trust those people to choose the collective good if they are heavily motivated by their own intrinsic hedonistic uh, uh, desires? Uh, so there was a huge conflict. And that this is this seed that actually led the Western media in general to shift from being a mean to create an informed citizens to have a functional democracy to a tool that is drive to create a, 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 um, or, or to engineering consent, as Edward Bernays said. That's our job is actually to con engineer consent and make people actually align with the nation itself. And the debate is still happening until now. So Edward Bernays actually did prove his concept by appealing to irrationality and hedonistic desires. And everyone in the marketing industry right now is familiar with the word sex sales. What does that mean? We're not appealing to any rationality. I'm not explaining how good a car is. You're going to put a, whatever, something beautiful around it and then bring some kind of association and then somehow people will be persuaded. So he did build his case of saying how we can influence people and how is it that masses cannot be actually trusted because they're driven by their own intrin intrin intrinsic needs or desires. I'll give you one of, the, one of his uh, stories that he actually demonstrated how people can actually be manipulated and they cannot be trusted um, um, to, to uh, be trusted to, to lead the uh, functional democracy. One of his clients, a tobacco company, called him and said, how have the society they're not smoking? Is there anything we could do? He called a psychologist, since he's the nephew of uh, Sigmund Freud, and making a long story uh, short, they did agree that in order to persuade women to smoke, let's sell them that the cigarette is actually a torch of freedom, just like the Statue of Liberty. So it's completely irrational, emotional. Women are struggling to a certain extent in, in, in the United States to find their own uh, 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 rights. And how are we going to uh, associate tobacco to their fight of freedom? Rationally, can, you, it's not, you can't find the connection. So he asked four beautiful ladies to walk on a certain boulevard for four or five blocks um, and then ask journalists to go and ask those ladies, why do you walk on this boulevard and, and smoking? It was a taboo. It was not accepted at all. And they start, you know, saying it's a form of protest. And this actually cigarette is my torch of freedom to demonstrate my lack of acceptance of the certain domination of male and et cetera, and the list goes on and on. How long ago are we talking? So it was, I think it was in the, in, right after the World War II. It's 60, in the 50s, 50, no, 60. it was in the 50s when they started smoking. So uh, now around the States, in every state, ladies were gathering, lighting up cigarettes as a form of, of, of demonstration and, and, and fighting for their own rights. Wow. So he's saying, you want to trust those people rationally. So those people, his argument, that are driven by their own intrinsic desires, can we trust them actually to decide what is a common good for all of us? So the debate is still going until now. 
I'll give you an example. That made us actually question, what's the role of media? Should, are we supposed to trust masses and, uh, and, and let them decide whatever they want to decide? And our job as media is to make them uh, informed and enable them to make that decision. Or, or we should just try so hard to engineer this consent, as he said, uh, and, and kind of like put them in, in a domain where we would maintain uh, a cohesion within the society itself. Let's take an example for what if we are in a war as a journalist? What would you do? Tell them the whole truth, everything that is happening there. What does that even mean? Does that equal treason? You're telling things that would benefit the enemy. So you see, it's kind of like really tough. So Edward Bernays kind of like uh, really shook the foundation of journalism and how they teach us in, in, in school how to be objective, etc. So should we trust masses? Should we not trust masses? Well, I think the debate is still going. Without him, the media landscape today is totally different. It would be totally different. Uh, a lot of people did contribute, but, but he is actually sort of like a, a, a pivotal point that happened of how do we deal with masses. And he did succeed. It's not that he didn't. He did succeed in shaping and forming what the masses want. How, how did they deal with, with communism? How did they use fear? Irrational fear was not explained. They said that's a monstrous people who would do this and that and that and that and keep repeating that and it w did work. And that's a bit of Nazism that uh, their model of unifying a single message to make people actually uh, believe in a certain thing irrationally. Speaking of irrational fear, did we see an example of that again three years ago with COVID? Um, it was not irrationality as much as it was lack of information. It's we don't know, and no one can say that this COVID is going to do one, two, three, four. The level of the veil of ignorance was so thick that we could not see through it. Hence, a lot of theories, a lot of explanations, and we've seen how people lack preliminary experience would go there and actually explain how we're supposed to deal with that. So I think the, the veil of ignorance what what led us to have that justified fear of the unknown. So we had to take maximum cover and treat it as if it was the Spanish yes. flu of 1920. Yes, yes, to a certain extent, yes. Because I, I just look around and tourism sector, mm. maybe aviation to some extent, and God knows what other sectors are still struggling to get back on their feet true. two years removed. True, true. Uh, I, I think it's it's still, again, it's, it's a surprise. It's a lack of information that drove a lot of conspiracy theories. Lack of clarity will, will raise conspiracies. We as humans, we have to explain why things happen. If you're not going to feed me facts, I'll come up with my own illusions. That's, that's, that's very known in communication. Let me tell you what to think. Let me tell you, no, I'll, I'll feed you the information I'll that would, would, would push you out, out of this, this uh, conspiracy and illusions that you would live. But look at history. We have to explain things. Superstitions, I mean, something happened, we have to have an explanation for it, whether it's true or not. Maybe Edward Bernays would be clapping right now saying, yes, yeah. you know, <laughs> I told you so. Uh, I don't fully agree with him, but I think it's there's a balance between the two. Um, I cannot use the exception of a war uh, to, to make it a rule on, on the peaceful times. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's, it's based on the situation itself. Yeah, totally. You said something... Uh couple minutes ago about the moon landing and it's something that intrigued me for many years when I saw a micro segment of Joe Rogan and he was asking someone uh, who was an, a non-believer of the moon landing yes and I think Rogan is is, is torn between the two got me thinking mm -hmm. and then I saw the why I saw why they'd want to do it for, okay. for global dominance all right is do you have a theory uh, of of you know did they did they not and if they didn't why they would Personally, my position is they did it. They did it. I think the issue right now is not whether people are, I mean, landed on the moon or not. I think the issue is lack of trust in government, governmental mm -hmm. narrative to be specific. Again, the model many to many created a lot of distor distortion that the governments themselves, they cannot actually keep up with. Um, um, and everything, they start questioning everything. Um, so going back to conspiracy theory, again, if, if the government governments, and I'm using an S here, are not going to increase a level of clarity 
people would find an explanation or a justification that governments would not like. That's why we in communication are thriving right now. People actually need to communicate and explain and make sure that people are satisfied and build level of credibility where people would 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 uh, trust. So landing on moon, uh, uh, reopening debates that uh, that we thought that were settled before. Uh, to a certain extent, it is a healthy thing, but it's increased the uh, the the responsibility of governments to tackle these these uh, issue. I can say that a freedom should have a domain and boundaries, or otherwise we're going to be everywhere. Especially with this objective truth that we're going through right now, it's a load of craziness is un, uh, unreached before, I believe. So um, again, lack of credibility led us to question the things that are on the fringe of believability, if that's even a word. So we're going to start there and then creeping, uh, go creeping inside and start questioning other things. I don't want to go into gender and all the other things that people are questioning <laughs> right now, but it's crazy out there. It is, it is, especially when it was pointed to my attention that uh, certain reflections and shadow uh, shadows on the moon were not where they should have been. And... Um, and 50 years, six years later, people are seeing that, uh, yeah, there is a question mark over the credibility of that landing. So well, they're landing soon, let's say in three years from now. They're saying they will. So we'll see about that. Could be for the first time. <laughs> in terms of global dominance, our Western media outlets where they once were in their heyday or at their peak. Where are we in terms of peak and dominance of Western media? I think they peaked about 10 to 15 years ago. They're descending right now. The post 9-11 era? I think maybe to a certain extent but I think it was clear five years ago with the rise of the uh, extreme right and subjective reality and all the other chaotic things that are happening right now within the Western culture. I think they're no longer following the three pillars that I've talked about. Let me explain that. The Western media is no longer talking about your own rights. It's not about you anymore. Somehow, somehow, it's about this few minorities and how are we supposed to deal with them rather than what we should all have. So we've shifted from a very inclu inclusive narrative to a very ex exclusive one. They're not telling you what you're entitled to as an individual. They lost universality. They're talking about those few minorities should be dealt with like this. And they start bombarding us with this. And a lot of cultures actually rejected that and they've lost their own appeal. And they're still actually insisting on that. They've lost their own uh, inclusive approach. Some people would argue that because there is no dialogue, uh, ideological conflict anymore, they start now propagating their own message since there's no uh, competition. Um, but again, that made them lose one of the most important pillars. No inclusive, they're not, they're not inclusive, they're not, not talking about my own rights as, 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 a, as, as one of their audience. The second pillar, which is dialogue, it's almost demolished. If if truth is if freedom is more important than truth, then you will never have freedom. And we've seen how the they call it truth decay, and truth is actually collapsing, and it's subjective. So it's my truth versus your truth. So instead of having a dialogue, right now we're having a monologue. And it's really ridiculous. There's no invitation whatsoever. You should respect me in my own opinions, in my own irrational opinion. Edward Bernays is now coming again. And my own subjective uh, truth, because I'm a free person. And then we've lost it. You cannot engage. You're supposed to have your own monologue that you're entitled to, but I'm not going to engage in any kind of dialogue since we have different truths. How in the world would we have a dialogue uh, there? So one of the bases of of, 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 of a human uh, rise and starting from the basic logical structure and saying, I think therefore I am, 
we have shifted to I feel like, therefore I am. So how in the world would you find any rationality there? So I, the, the, I identify as. <laughs> I identify, uh, it's, it's just crazy. Um, again, freedom cannot trump truth. It's as simple as that. It's so powerful. So the, the second pillar, demolished completely. Uh, um, there's still some residue still there. The, the, the extreme right and the right is becoming more rational actually right now, and they're fighting, they're bringing truth in as, as more responsible, as more important than actually freedom. They're trying to balance between um, freedom and responsibility. We see uh, Jordan Peterson um, and a lot of um, American, let's say, um, intellects uh, are trying actually to push back against this uh, wave. But again, there's no longer a dialogue. The third one is opportunities. I don't think that they are as inclusive as they used to be before. And we've seen this demonstrated in the refugees crisis, and we've seen how the hypocrisy manifested itself. They're no longer actually inviting. Uh, I think it's written in the, in the Statue of Liberty that give us your poor, give us. A, mm -hmm. uh, it's no longer believed. And, and, and actually, they're building walls around their own countries to prevent others from coming in. So it's not the land of opportunities and bye bye to the American dream. Um, um, so that's that's the third pillar. I don't see any call to action and I don't find the, the Western culture inviting me as, 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 as they used to 10 years ago. So they are actually collapsing. So they've replaced, they're actually done the opposite of the three pillars that made them very dominant uh, media and they're losing. The founding fathers most likely wouldn't be happy with what's happening on the ground there. The moment is a lot different to what it was like in 19, or sorry, 1845, was it? So I think um, they had their own issues. Let's not just say they're not going to be happy. They had their own issues. It's just that the, the appeal of the West is, is, is kind of like gone. They're struggling economically, socially, and there's a lot of issues that are happening uh, uh, right now with the, with the society. Mm. What's the definition of a society? A set of people who believe in a core values that would define what is good and what is bad. Look at the United States. Do you think that they agree on core values? Not today. Not today. I mean, we literally see monologues. There's no dialogue whatsoever. They don't agree. They cannot even agree on what's right and what's wrong. How can I find myself in one single trench fighting with someone who would disagree with me on core values? If, my, if, I, if, I, if what I believe is right, you believe is wrong then how in the world would we would we be in the same team yeah. so a society itself is, is is collapsing it's such a divide i mean uh, when, when when a president wins by 51 percent yes yes about 170 180 million people who aren't for the person in charge it's it's it's, it's crazy it's just it's it's really it's, crazy. it's terrifying honestly yeah. that's I was wrong about 1845. I don't know where I got that from. 1776. Seven. Of course, July 4th, 1776. Going back to its, um, do you, uh, the truth is better than, what was it? It was such a good line that you said, um, truth versus opinion. and Truth trumps uh, freedom. Truth trumps freedom. Let's do that again. Mm. Going back to what you said about truth trumping mm. freedom. Mm. I look at, from a credibility standpoint, I look at Fox, I look at CNN, and it's a sitcom today. How True. two very reputable news corporations are saying two completely different things because they're both politically charged in different ways. They're, they're, they're not politically charged. They have two different audiences that they're serving. Slash agendas. Yeah, I mean, everyone would, would like to live in his own ideological bubble. And I think it's clearly manifested between those two, 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 two channels, that they, we, we have our own audience, we have a different set of values that we could not even agree on anything. I mean, what kind of identity do we have in the United States? Is it geographical? Is it biological? Is it ideological? Because clearly it's not ideological. Is it just, a, what's the bond between us? Is it moral or is it just legal? How would you define my response? What is nationalism? What does it mean to be an American? I mean, some, some intellects right now that are agreeing, uh, they're, they're discussing that, that we are in a new era where we call it post-nationalism. So the bond between the citizens and the government is actually legal more than moral. So how could you divide responsibilities and, and, and rights? And what does that mean? Is it just legal? And you see, so the soul of the nation is no longer there.
if morality is no longer, how would you drive morality? Is it subjective? Is it really, really subjective? So you see this struggle that, uh, that is extremely uh, um, um, severing micro bonds that exist between individuals, it's just, it's just crazy. I mean, it's, it, you can see cracks that is happening in the Western uh, uh, culture and you can guarantee that it's not going to continue to be a dominant, at least from my own perspective. It's not going to be continue to be dominant as long as they keep fragmenting each other from, from, from within. Yeah, I mean, I, I hear it from my American friends and, and I have a, a bunch of them. I lived there for many years. They're very frustrated with what's happening. True. Very frustrated. True, true. So they're not going to be a long, they, they cannot be a dominant culture if they have a very fragmented society. The society, the cohesiveness of the society itself is the main engine to export culture. So if this society no longer exists in its actually traditional form, then how in the world would you export the culture? If people themselves actually disagree. In agreement we stand, in disagreement we fall. True. Um, they don't have a society. What's happening right now is actually really interesting. I call it a new Cold War, but it's actually from a social perspective. And this, the fault lines of this Cold War is actually going across countries, going uh, across institutions, going across even some houses where people would be divided based on their own values. And what's so interesting, what used to be the left in the Cold War, i.e. China and, and Russia, they're actually on the right socially. So we've shifted. So there's a huge shift when it comes to social uh, uh, Cold War that I call it right now that, that is happening. And what's so interesting, it's not sponsored by governments. It's actually sponsored by institutions, social institutions, and active individuals, as you said, that those people are become actually more dominant and they can communicate with millions and democratization of media through technology right now and digital platforms. Um, so we're having this new cold social war where you would find the Saudi from Riyadh with another one uh, individual from Moscow and a third one from Texas in one trench okay. against Another trench where we find someone from Los, Los Angeles and then maybe someone in, pa in Paris. And you would rarely find in the social uh, uh, left social front, we'd find someone from the from the Eastern culture. So it's kind of like they're, they're really shrinking, but they're really successful at dissecting and building fault lines across the world. So there's an interesting fight right now that we, the East, might find ourselves with a lot of Western individuals fighting on the same front <laughs> that that would be a first i mean to find like-minded people from the cultures that you mentioned that's the digital uh, platforms right now are enabling to find your own needs yes. let alone finding find this tribe, yeah yeah so yeah. people are actually we can find that in hashtags where i would say is southeast and then someone from russia would agree on, mm. a, on a social issue and agree on a certain value that against the other and and all this is happening within the Western culture. It's not happening on other cultures. Yep. Like uh, people are not debating on what's happening, let's say, in Filipino or Indonesia. They're actually all debating what's happening maybe in the Western uh, culture and the canceling culture, ridiculousness, the objective truth, and all these things. And yeah. and and uh, maybe maybe some Americans and conservative Americans will find allies and in, in, in conservatives across the world. And maybe they need it because, as you said, it's 51 versus 49 and then again. But if you would build a coalition with the international conservatives, then you're going to win. I think a big one is also homosexuality. Yeah. Um, you have... It's imposed. It that's, that's the problem with it. Us and the Russians and, and, and clearly some old school people in, in, in the Western world where that wasn't okay it's when they were It's a tectonic up. shift. What used to be left right now is right socially. What used to be left economically, i.e. socialism, uh, communism, when it comes to social aspect, they're actually extremely on the right. So is the world, are we creating a new front right now as conservatives versus is, this, is the right creating a new front against the left? And how big is the right versus the, the left? That's, that's, a, that's a, I believe it's an interesting question that we need to look it up and, and Absolutely. find the numbers. But it's, it's a very, very complicated fault lines that is happening right now. Speaking of fault lines, um... Do you see California spinning off one day to become a state of its own? I see Texas. Texas. Uh, yes. Spinning off as, it is, as, as its own state. Why specifically? Um, economically, they're really well. They have different set of values. 
um, the, the the cohesiveness of the society itself is 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 good, and, and they've tried to have they, they're, they're having an internal debate of, of, of having a referendum where they might have their own uh, independency. Um, so it's possible, and this is this is the 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 byproduct of the of whatever, whatever that is happening right now. If, what does it mean? So what I believe is right. You're talking about abortion, LGBT, and all these uh, social issue, uh, respective religion, uh, all these things that people cannot actually find in agreements. So what do the Americans uh, agree upon? That's that's my question right now. Is it just property, uh, freedom, this elusive? Uh, term that no one can define and everyone is abusing um, they're a patriotic bunch they are they are so maybe there's a debate there still uh, going maybe that the I think, I think their economies is, could make them one of the g20 so it, it, they are that big Texas yes yes that's, that's fascinating so yes so uh, now the Americans actually are trying to do something so the Silicon Valley is actually emigrating to Texas yeah trying Austin, to Austin specific yeah they're trying to bring it back. It's one of the maybe politicians they are aware of this. That actually it's it's cheaper right now. People are more, uh, um, let's say, inclusive. They can understand things from an economical perspective. They're trying actually to reattach Texas to the United States through the immigration of the Silicon Valley to to Austin. They were they had their own story in the last couple of months. Silicon Valley with the banks failing. Oh yes, oh yes, uh, but but I think the main bond is kind of like economical more than social, which is not a good thing. It's it's not a good thing. We don't have a set of values that we agree upon that defines what's right and what's wrong. Then we're no longer a society. Yeah. I was in the States. I was in school in Boston uh, during 9-11, and I think that was the turning point of when Saudis became the villain. I said it on the last episode or two episodes ago. I'm like, we became yes. a villain overnight. I'm trying to remember who the villain was before us. Uh, it, 20 years later, still, we I feel that, you know, we're getting bashed as if, um, I don't know, they just don't like us for some reason. Can you figure out why? Well, you have to have an enemy. Communism collapsed with the Berlin Wall and all that. And the only civilization that exists in the world that are actually competing with the Western culture on a moral front is the Islamic culture. And what is the core state of the Islamic culture? Saudi. Saudi Arabia. It's as simple as that. It is normal as a core state to be bombarded by all the other core states of the other civilization, Hindu, Confucius, uh, Orthodox, Catholic, uh, Protestant, uh, and uh, all the other civilization as Samuel Huntington wrote in his book, Clash of Civilization. And he did say uh, in his book that maybe the Islamic civilization is the new enemy that we need in order to unify ourselves. So that external boogeyman or whatever you want to want to call it, you need to have that external threat that exists in order to unify us from, from, from within. Um, it's very tough to actually decide that two, uh, 2 billion, 25% of the world population is your enemy. I mean, they're failing there. Uh, and I think what's 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 more important than that is is for us as Saudis as a core state of Islam. How are we going to manage this? It's not that we feel victimized, that we are attacked and held. We will be held responsible, directly or indirectly, of any civilization clash that is happening between the Islamic culture and all the other cultures. They're going to come direct to Saudi Arabia. Now the question is, how are we going to manage it as Saudis? That is the question. Are we doing enough? As a core state, are we communicating in a proper way? Can we export our own narrative? Are we exporting our own narrative? Mm -hmm. What is exactly that we're doing as a core state with the Islamic culture? So the attack will happen, whether we like it or not. We need to make peace with that. You think the critical issue is how are we going to manage it? I can't help but think that us shaking hands with our Iranian neighbors a few weeks ago, I can't imagine that that was news that the Americans wanted to see. Again, here's what's so interesting about the American uh, culture. You cannot define the Americans in one single no. bucket and say the Americans believe that. So that's, much what's so, that's what's so interesting about it. And that's this is the residue of the, the second pillar, which is the dialogue. I cannot say that the Americans. You see, the fragmentation of the American narrative through dialogue, you cannot attack the whole nation. And maybe that's something we should learn from as Saudis. 
that this internal dialogue that is exported to others allow others to understand our own internal context and they understand. You know, they don't have to adopt our own narrative, our own way of living, but at least they do understand. Now my question is, do we, are we exporting our own internal dialogue? So people can say, well, there are certain Saudis who believe in that and others believe in that, and maybe I agree with this and, and agree in that. Maybe we, we it, it's an opportunity for us to learn from that. So, um, again, it's very hard to define what the American would, would say about our own uh, agreement. I like the approach that we're taking right now, sorry, the growth. Many political analysts right now are saying the hegemon ended. The United States no longer leading the world. And every core state of every civilization will take a way bigger role right now to remanage of the multipolar world right now that is happening. So our role as Saudis is growing by day right now. Um, and, and we see this manifested in, in, in the new uh, moves that the, that the Saudis are taking right now. So again, it's very difficult, which is very healthy to export the nation to pinpoint and say the Americans would do that. So again, we should learn from that. So would you say that China is the new sheriff in town per se? No. As Samuel Huntington said in his book, the, the Confucius civilization that is headed by the Chinese, they don't have any specific ideology to be exported, especially after the collapse, the collapse of communism. Um, they're very economical driven. We're not. We st our own ideology as Muslims is actually to advocate, to spread the message. They don't have that. They have a very economical approach of the, it has a, a byproduct where we, you should have more political influence in order to prosper further. That is understandable. But again, there is no ideology uh, um, to be exported. Like the Chinese are not presenting a different way of living that would replace the Western style of living. We do. That's why we're in a huge moral conflict of how we're supposed to live our life. We believe we are morally superior. That's what's... what's uh, uh, Samuel Huntington said in his, in his book, two actually cultures, the Confucius and the Muslims, they believe Muslims, the muse, yes, here, I want to use the other letter. We believe that we are morally more superior. We're content with whatever moral structure that we have. The problem that we're having right now in the world is most of the people, they believe that um, human evolution is linear, and it's not. It's really not. Technologically, maybe, but morally, no, it's not. Uh, so this is the conflict that we're having since people have this confusion between technological advancement somehow would equal to a higher moral moral ground uh, that would enable you to dictate and communicate and tell people how they're supposed to live. Because I'm the strongest, hence I'm better than you. I'm good and you're bad because you're weak and I'm good because uh, I'm strong. Evolution, Darwinian way of actually explaining the world. Clearly, when it comes to media, no one did it the way they did, and, and we were second tier to them, we as a region. What learnings can we incorporate to put us in a position where we are or could be as close as to how dominant they once were? Okay. So we talked about three pillars that allow the Western media to dominate. We have in the eastern side of the world, and they say starting from the Middle East up to the Far East, we have three pillars that prevented us from having this dominating narrative or exportable narrative. The first one is, as Easterns in general, we talk about duties. Most of our narrative is about what you should do because we are, we're very religious in general. The eastern side of the world, they tend to use their uh, right hemisphere way more than the left. And there's a lot of arguments that would explain how, why do we tend to talk about duties more than rights. And there's an afterlife where you're going to be held responsible for your actions. So the reward is going to happen after. It's not now. So hence that created this duty culture where the governments, the governing bodies are talking to you what you should do in order to get that reward. So that's why the narrative of media survived locally. But we failed miserably to actually export it. You cannot tell people what to do across cultures, but you can't tell them what they are entitled to across cultures. And this is where we fail. We did not define a set of universal values that we could export. 
in, in, in Saudi Arabia? Is it collectivism or individualism? Which one is better? I can bet that saying as Saudis that we believe in collectivism. Individualism is some sort of uh, actually selfishness, narcissistic aspect for us in our own culture. Um, but if we export collectivism, we can do that. It's very universal. A lot of people actually would be aligned with us. Is it family or is it individuals? Take care of yourself first. Oh my God, in Saudi Arabia, we just reject that completely. Yeah. Maybe some people would disagree, but the dominant narrative is that if you take care of yourself and, and not taking care of others, then you're a selfish guy. I don't want to use other terms, but it, it's not accepted here. Is it, so what about family? What about respective religion? Um, is there anything in our own culture that would prevent us from having any technological advancement? So again, our failure of defining this universe of values to be exported and go across cultures prevented our narrative from being uh, uh, communicated to other uh, cultures. That's the first pillar. And it's not for the Saudis. I'm talking about the East in general or the Eastern countries. Uh, the second pillar is the unifying narrative. And oh my God, picture this. One single narrative defining a whole nation. How would the Western media would deal with the governmental narrative? How do they even deal with their own governmental narrative? Very suspicious. They don't really believe them. And they really work as the watchdog, the fourth state, to actually counter any narrative that comes out of the government. And I see some media specialists here in Saudi Arabia would come and say, oh, look at how biased they are. And I would say, you don't even know their function. How could you unify a narrative trying to define what is Saudi Arabia in one single narrative and send it to the rest of the world and wonder why would the Western media, the most dominant one until now, maybe they're degrading, but they're still dominant, would deal with that. So is your narrative exportable? Now imagine if there's a dialogue, different side of the stories, how would the journalist would deal with it? Can he attack the whole nation? Never. They would lose credibility instantly. Mm -hmm. So this is the second pillar, unifying narrative. No dialogue. The fourth one is we talk about achievements. Oh my God, we celebrate achievements like we're almost bragging. Look what the tallest building in the world, the biggest project there. But there's no call, call to action. What does that mean to investors around the world? Is there a call to action? What does it mean to talents? Do they see themselves in our own country or the Eastern countries? Is there any invitation there or is it just bragging? So you see the difference between we have those three pillars that completely the opposite of the Western pillars that made them dominant. And then we're wondering, why is it that we failed? I'm so optimistic about what's happening right now. There's a lot of investment. Oh, no, my God, I'm so happy with what's happening right now. The tools, the technology, importing talents and all that. It's really great. But if you follow the same pillars that prevented us from exporting, we will fail. Definitely we will fail. We've seen how the Koreans did it. They did very well, but they've westernized the nation to, to, to unbelievable level. So it's a, it's, a, it's a Korean flavor rather than being a Korean content. Is that what we're going to do? Is this how we're going to export our own narrative? I mean, I know Korea is not a core state. We are a core state. Let me give you another example. A lot of people would argue that in order to export narrative, you have to be a democratic nation, etc. Scandinavian countries, yeah. the best in the world when it comes to standards of living, etc. How many shows have you seen? What kind of values do they believe in? Do we even know a part of their languages? We don't. Nothing. Because they're not a core state. And that would tell you the opportunity that we have as Saudis, as a core state that the sphere of influence expand upon 2 billion people. 25% of the world is within the sphere, the soft uh, uh, sphere of influence of, of, of Saudi Arabia. Are we capitalizing on this or are we still complaining how the other core states are attacking us? So we need to manage this. That's at least my own opinion about this matter. I think uh, the rest of the world attacking us bothers me more than it bothers the country. Uh, I think the country today knows who they are in the international field, let's say. I think they know what they bring to the table. And the most important thing is there is belief on the ground with my generation who are pretty much in charge in so many different sectors. Growing up, 
there was a bit of a it wasn't the same the we, were, we would always look to neighboring countries and you know, this could be better that could be better but today there's so much excitement and motivation and and belief that oh no with time we're not just going to hit 20 30 figures we are going to surpass it definitely and uh, nothing nothing will stop us from making anything better uh, and Sumu Sayyidi Al Amir Muhammad bin Salman, I believe today, looks at the country in a way where, oh, that can be better. Okay, we're going to make it better. That's great. Anything that could be better today is the opportunity to make it better. So you cannot be the best by copying. No. It's as simple as that. And that's not our style. Uh, definitely. And this is what I like. We even acknowledge that. We don't need to copy. Bring the best practices, bring the best tools, but we do it our own way. I, you cannot export any narrative if people are not involved. Who's exporting the American narrative to us? Is it the government itself? It's the people. Yeah. The role of the government is not to communicate and manage this bombardment that comes from other nations. It's to enable the people. You cannot reach other nations, people, through a governmental narrative from another nation. Yeah. The only way to do it is actually to go through your own people. People can talk to other people and build that beautiful dialogue where we can communicate. Of course, we need to define zones of dialogue, zones where we sell opportunities, zones where we sell our own rights that is completely aligned with, with our own political structure and social structures. We have our own consensus. We don't want to do the same mistake that the American did. Freedom, and then it's done. We have our own way of living, and the government itself is actually responsible to maintain that cohesion by knowing what's right and what's wrong, what's, what's our own core values, and this is it. Yes, you can have a debate about that to a certain extent, but again, it's need to fit. And all this illusions that you have to be westernized in order to export your narrative. No. That's not acceptable. Oh, Korea. Korea. Exhibit A. They're doing, they're doing very well to copy. I think they're still doing it. They've done that in, in cars. They're actually evolving. Maybe it's a process that they, they, they justify to themselves. We need to copy them very well and then move on. And we've seen this working very well in, from an economical perspective. But I don't think we can afford it as a core state. Can you imagine the cost of a core state of the Islamic culture is actually copying another nation? What, what kind of damage that would do to us? Terrific. And I've seen some people actually celebrating a lot of, let's say, uh, positive media coverage, especially in the Western media. Let's say in New York Times. They were, sometimes they did have a, a positive coverage of Saudi Arabia. How much would it cost us in our own sphere of influence when it comes to Pakistan and the public support? Have we ever calculated that cost as a core state? So mimicking, copying is ridiculously expensive and something as a core state we cannot afford. I cannot emphasize this enough. We have the tools right now. We have the political desire. We have the appetite to invest heavily. But let's not follow uh, uh, the same principles that prevented us, or pillars prevented us from exporting uh, the narrative uh, again. What role does tourism play, would you say, in our quest to export? Now, I think it's what, 80, 90 countries can get a visa in five minutes on, on the e-visa portal. That's great. It's, it's, it's amazing. Uh, you see, what's so interesting is that Tourism is, is mainly, what do they do, mainly in the summer, is to build mosaics around the world. A different culture would go from Riyadh to Paris, to Paris. let me just call it oh, like I that. I like that. <laughs> Paris. <laughs> um, so I, I, I say, when we travel in the summer, we see a lot of cities that they turn to from one single maybe unifying uh, color and set of values to, to a beautiful mosaic where people actually get together without mixing. So I know you, I'm familiar with you, I understand you. I don't have to adopt your own way of living. And that's what, that's what tourism would do, would bring people in, they'll understand our own way of living, and this is why, and they would see the context that we fail to export. You know what's so interesting in dialogue, when we export our own internal dialogue, we actually export context. Mm -hmm. that people don't have to come actually to see. They would see what kind of dialogue that we have, and they would know what's our uh, uh, consensus and what are the things that we're having a debate on and what would think to be, uh, what, what are the things that we consider to be uh, uh, a dissent? Yeah. Uh, so people being here in Saudi Arabia 
and exporting our own internal dialogue would have the same effect. Would people come here and understand, not necessarily adopt? We, we, we get to influence the narrative now or own the narrative when in yesteryear we couldn't. True, true. And that's, that's really interesting. Digitization, democratization of media, et cetera. It's, it's, now it's, 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 it's on us. No one else to blame but us. And I think this would help us, inshallah, in the, in the, in the near future to demonstrate uh, what we missed uh, in, in the last uh, few decades. Mm -hmm. Culturally speaking, was mm -hmm. there a barrier, would you say, that prevented the region in excelling in media? Was was Arabic a hindrance at all? I mean, we we, we touched on Korea and how it was. Yes, but did that play a factor at all? L let me let me talk about. Um, I don't think the language is is a barrier uh, in itself. When we talk about cultural barriers, I think the main barrier, especially for us as Saudis, is our negative relation with the image since the beginning of Islam and how some actually were worshipping idols or were built or manifested in a way that looks like other humans. So so the the, the literature and, and justifications why we had the negative relations is, is I'm not going to delve into that. I'm not the specialist. But I'm talking about the, our negative relationship with the image and, and, and how did it impact our own way of actually communicating with the rest of the world. First of all, most of the Saudis refrain from working, refrain from working in, 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 in TV, radio, and all that. And if you could Google this, you would find our, any technology of communication was introduced to us. We had a very negative relationship with radio, TV, Early mobiles. Days. Yes, and it's still, I mean, even cell phone. I mean, you remember that when they introduced cameras and how do we, we're struggling socially to integrate that. So we had a very yeah. negative relationship with the image. What does that mean to us? No one is on TV. Drama is dead. Foreigners start leading our own media. We've lost any sort of uh, cultural understanding or representation. Most of the TV that is led by foreigners was just an entertainment device. Make us laugh, tell us about the world, bring some scientific content, but you don't represent me at all. And most of the foreigners, they come with their own agenda, with their own values, that they're almost dictating. Have you seen how they celebrate us as Saudis? Have you seen the ads that's still happening right now and how is it completely detached from us as Saudis? There's nothing there actually represent us. How in the world would we export our own culture if the main tool, which is the image, is not even uh, used by us? Mm. Right now, we're fixing it. But the impact is so significant. The drama we've seen, you and I when we were kids, no Saudis, few Saudi men may be there. It's been fixed partially, but the damage is so huge that we, I think we're gonna continue suffering for the next, next five, 10 years at least. Yeah, tough to reverse. It's, it's very tough to reverse. So the cultural barrier is our negative relation with the image and struggle. And how, do we, how in the world would we? export our own narrative if we don't make peace with the image and try to utilize it in a way that would fit our own social uh, or cultural uh, structure. So that uh, of itself is, is, is the, oh, I believe from a social perspective is the main barrier that prevented us as, as a Saudi, as a core state to continue our own influence. We don't use the image. And then comes into play the rebranding of who you are today. You're now open to the world. We touched on tourism. But in your quest to modernize while staying too true to your roots, that's a challenge in its own. I, I don't think it's my, if you would understand modernization, modernization as, as westernization, then yes, we have an issue there. But if you would think of it as look at the world, take whatever that exists there that it could help us to enhance our own the good selves and then communicate with the world. Again, I'll continue keeping this from in, in a communication perspective is easy it's very easy to delve into other topics especially when you talk about culture um westernization does not equal modernization interesting and 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 this is this is what a lot of people actually would argue to reject modernization because it equals westernization if we don't able our own and let's say local talents to grab this technology, to grab 
uh, 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 this new trends and then build our own narrative, then we would fail. But again, another social barrier. What kind of media did we consume when we were kids? TV. TV. How many uh, of the content that we consumed was actually a Saudi? Can you imagine how difficult for me as a content yeah. uh, writer to struggle and have to do my own research about my own country yeah. to understand what the heck is going on? Nothing was. Our kids are singing songs from Sesame Street. Correct. And, 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 and it's completely, then I never saw a kid actually singing a song that I used to hear from my grandmother. It's, it's not there. So it's the reversing, the re-exploring ourselves, extracting those treasures that are hidden under hells of sands would take some time. It would. I thought Captain Majid was Saudi for a minute. It's not. It's, it's, I don't know why they call it Majid, by the way. Is it because Majid Abdullah is, I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure. Good question. <laughs> it could be. I would bet on that. Yeah. And, and that was exported by Japan. That's actually what of, uh, would lead us when we talk about sport is, Look at the Saudi, how did they create this zone of dialogue within the sport domain? We're the most dominant one in the uh, Arabic world. Region, yeah. Not even close. I mean, uh, bringing uh, uh, this healthy debate that is defined to fit with their own culture in the sport domain made us the best mm -hmm. in the region. And then if we invest even more, I can guarantee we'll go to the world. Cristiano Ronaldo. I think we quantitatively, when it comes to sport, we're doing very well. We are. But qualitatively, we have to work on it even more. So you see, this zone of dialogue allowed us as Saudi to export to the rest of the world and everyone wanted to engage and be part of it. Imagine taking that zone that we defined, where we had to have a dialogue about sport and then put it in social and make sure and retail it. And that's a responsibility of the government to retail that zone and define, okay, we could have also another dialogue here that would make our narrative mm. very exportable. So you see, those dynamics that we are missing that would help us to fulfill our role as a core state and 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 crowd out all this uh, maybe uh, narratives that are actually bombarding us right now yeah rasul uh, uh, peace be upon him he said ala rislikum inna safiya what does that mean it shows the moral obligation of when two of the sahaba passed by and saw rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam talking to a woman they start walking fast like they don't want to acknowledge that they saw him and he turned around and explained what so did he, what did he say my wife. So it tells us to a certain extent that I'm not supposed, I'm, I'm morally obligated to clarify the misunderstanding. And then I don't care after that. But it is, it is my responsibility to correct any misconception or perception that exists uh, out there to a certain extent. Not to reach a level to become uh, apologetic, no. which I see a lot in the media. Well, hold on for us, we're going to catch up and all that th narrative. No, it's not. It's different. It's not what you think. It's this, and then it's done. Morally, I'm done here. And it's up to them and their own racism, so to speak, uh, to deal with, with the, the perception, the perception that, they can shape them, uh, the, that they can shape themselves. Yeah. Um, draw me a picture of what you hope to see in the region, media-wise, 10 years from now. What is your best case scenario? I think we are in the in the in the right direction, and I'm so excited of things that are happening right now, especially with the the Ministry of Culture, uh, and the enablement, the the rebuilding of 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 cultural industries, and how do we actually can propagate our own message and communicate with the rest of the world. Thanks, for, thanks for that. I'm 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 disappointed in myself that w I didn't bring up Ministry of Culture in the first hour of the episode. They have done so much uh -huh. to export our message to the true, world. Continue. Please. True. True. So we have the appetite from leadership to invest. We have the tools and we got all what we need. It's just we have to define what direction, what strategic steps that we need to take. Uh, please do not copy. Do not copy. Easier to export your information today than ever before. Uh, true. Uh, with this especially, uh, with this uh, fragmented international uh, uh, with this social cold war that is happening right now, I think there's an opportunity that we need to seize uh, as, as, as a coordination. Um, so again, 10, 10 years from now, I'm just so optimistic right now. I can't even fathom or imagine what we could achieve within that time. We're already doing it. We are already doing it. Uh, it it's, it's just, a, I see us winning an Oscar. 
I see us actually bringing a new narrative that would mesmerize the rest of the world. I think we're going to bring new stories that would replace the Western narrative. They they bankrupt. Their, their imagination is almost done. They're reproducing whatever they succeed in the 80s and the 70s. They're even trying to humanize evil right now. They ran out, they ran out of evil versus good uh, narrative. Uh, I think we can bring something better. I think we can bring something way, way better. A new frontier. New frontier. It's, it's just a new uh, narrative that is going to make people actually listen to and understand our, 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 way, our way of living. What can governments do in order to support the exportation of that? It's just enablement. Enablement. Yeah. Empowering. Empowering. Avoid control. Detach yourself from the narrative. Sponsor it to a certain extent. Nurture it right now because it needs to grow, which, which the government is doing right now pretty well. Good job, especially in the Minister of Culture. But do not attach that narrative to you. If it's people, if it's from people to people, it will be exported. If it's from government to people, we will fail. Again, we'll go into those dynamics where the fourth state will come and uh, uh, let's say uh, deal with our own narrative in a very uh, spectic uh, uh, way and full of doubts and mistrust and the list goes on and on. But if it's from people, it's very dynamical and there's, there's a dialogue, the Saudi dialogue is actually being exported. I, I don't think that anyone can actually... Uh, uh, stop that narrative from being exported. It's us yeah. if we follow those things. So we don't want to follow their models of rights, dialogue, and opportunities the way that they did it. We don't want to exaggerate maybe freedom. We need to bring that balance that they're looking for between responsibility and freedom. We need to bring a dialogue that is compatible with our own social values, with our own political structure. And we need to, to send opportunities to the rest of the world where they can be part of the success that we're going through. These are the pillars that maybe to a certain extent, if we adopt and it's been defined in our own strategy, I think in 10 years, yeah, yeah. we'll be in a different domain. I wanted to get your thoughts on something. Um, earlier when we were speaking about the US and what happens over there, uh, which is gun control. I feel like there's a complete delusion that the region here is medieval and backwards, but <laughs> we people in, in Saudi in the region mm -hmm. have guns, they have licenses, for, for that, but you don't see what you see in the States. In the States, I think in 2023, I saw a horrific stat. There have been over 30 or 40 school shootings and we're only in the fourth month. I think it was Piers Morgan who said that. Guns are symptoms. They're not the problem. Mm. They need to look deeper. Is there a so solution for, for that? I mean, look at Yemen. How many guns do they have? Look at statistics. Maybe Statist more than citizens. Technically, yes. Why they don't have the same thing? You know, it's it's just the dealing with Simpson. It's 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 denial. You need to acknowledge the issue is actually beyond holding a gun. It's it's something. Why would he shoot? Is it because he has a gun? No. I mean, would that entail that everyone should have a gun? Are they mentally ill, the individual, or is it the society itself? What would stop him morally from doing what he did? That murderer who went to a school killing children. Blaming guns, just take out the tool and that would, would drive things down. I think it's a reaction by those who feel that society turned their backs on them. Uh, yeah, yeah. Partially, I would agree with you. But again, we need more scientific uh, analysis of, of getting the root cause of, of yeah. why is this happening? It's one too many. It's, it's so wolves. sad. Yeah. It's so sad. No, it's the saddest. It's, it's just unbelievable. It's, it's just unbelievable. And simplifying this horrific incidence into he should not be holding a gun. It's just crazy. On the right, they're talking about their own rights of protecting themselves, the Second Amendment and all that. I have the right to protect myself, my own property, etc., and all that narrative. And then you see on the other side that you should not have a gun. Why would you need a gun? We have a government and all that uh, narrative. So th those silos that prevent the society from healing, where each side, they have their own values and they cannot communicate. And the problem is, instead of creating this dialogue that would bring cohesion, where we would share more values than we used to, let's say yesterday or the day before, to trying to build a legal structure, laws, to settle a social dispute or a dialogue. And then this is how you create a divide within the nation itself. You're using laws, laws, not agreements, not a nation anymore, no, va no common values. 
that's what we're seeing, and hence, I don't think there will continue to be a dominant culture. Have you seen The Purge? A film? Yeah. Yes, yes. One yes. day a year, you can get back at anyone who did anything <laughs> to yes. you, and I've it makes it. people a lot more civilized. Not necessarily to you. You can do it to anyone, actually. To, to anyone. Which the would, idea of it was kind of interesting. Which defines, actually, the lack of, of moral ground. Which, which would define what's moral and what's not? I mean, we, mo- we, only, we mostly could agree and say that Moral could be defined that by the strong is protecting the weak. And anything that is immoral is where the strong is actually attacking the weak, not protecting one. And this is logical. But from where do you, where is the source that would drive all morality? Yeah, yeah uh, it's, uh, it's, obje- it's uh, not objective. It's, you see it's the struggle there? If we don't have this, uh, yeah, it's very subjective. It's, if we don't have this objective, solid thing that would unify us, and that should be fostered by the government, Edward Bernays, then we're gone. There, you will no longer have a society. Post-nationalism, uh, we're talking about truth decay, uh, monologues versus dialogue, and this this canceling, uh, is it cancel culture? Cancel culture, now? yeah. It's just crazy. Yeah. We see comedians, how they're actually struggling, tiptoeing around topics that they cannot even touch. It's a minefield. It's not a stage it anymore. Is. It is a minefield. I can see David uh, Chappelle and all the other comedians that we like. They're really struggling out there. They have to justify. I mean, if you would even quantify the amount of that a comedian should justify versus telling a joke, it's it's ridiculous. The sensitivity is just through the roof. True. People are just easily offended. True. I just don't get it. <laughs> um, who do you look up to? Who who were some of your mentors, uh, teachers? I like Jordan Peterson. I like Noam Chomsky. They're actually in a very opposing positions. Um, um, but I don't like them as individuals. I mean, the way that I like is I like some of the arguments that they're trying to present and how intellectually that they're trying to tackle these uh, uh, issues. Um, um, and also we have a lot of mentors, in, in, alhamdulillah, in our own uh, 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 on countries, uh, there's the scholars, the intellects, and all these beautiful arguments. And the main source definitely is your religion. My moral compass is defined by what I believe in, which is my own religion. So when you have that moral compass in your uh, pocket, you would not be lost. You could navigate in all the other cultures. This is maybe my mentor is that compass that created by the religion that I believe in, and it makes me navigate around different cultures simultaneously. Um, and I will never allow my compass to actually point always to the West, <laughs> as some others may be defined. <laughs> uh, their, their intellectual uh, uh, maturity by, by actually creating that compass that would point always to the West. Yeah. I would never yeah. do that. If you can send a message to anyone, <laughs> everyone's WhatsApp, if you will, okay. uh, <laughs> what would your message be? I, I don't think that I would, uh, uh, you, you can't have one message. Again, mm-hmm. I would go back to the dialogue. Okay. It's, it's just I had to open channels. You cannot use this mono, one directional messaging and expect people to. I would build actually channels of where people can communicate with each other and 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 understand the position that they are uh, in. It's really easy to make assumptions about other nations. Yes. We, we we are. It's, it's. I'm not saying that the Americans are doing it. We are actually no. doing it as, yeah. as Saudis. And how do we, we could brush the whole? We're all guilty. Of, I'm guilty of it. Definitely we are. It's just just when you're willing to understand, understand, not not necessarily agreeing and and listen to 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 other, I think we would have a way, way better world. I think go visit. like while while, while I asked it, I was thinking what mine would be, but I think go visit a country and and make your own opinion uh, on it. I think it can take you a long way. There's an old saying that if you don't like someone, it's because you don't know them. D- uh, true, but uh, I mean, do you know how hard it is for a human being to suspend judgment? It's just almost impossible. Almost impossible. If they don't have the truth that they're going to have to formulate their own uh, imaginative perception of, of others. And this is where we, uh, who are specialized in communication, need to eliminate that. Yeah. that they're going to come up with a conclusion if they don't have the right source of information. Mm-hmm. So... I think our job is actually to communicate, be transparent, to try to understand uh, other other cultures. Um, and 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 I respect your existence as someone who's totally different, and I, I and I expect the same. The problem is that, but, but and if I could go back to the Western 
a narrative right now. And one of the main pillars that actually uh, destroying their dominance is that they always ask me to dis to respect their right of disrespecting me. And I will never accept that. It's as simple as that. And and uh, uh, if we learn how to respect each other and communicate with each other, as you can think we have all the technology such we need to focus. Do not copy, do not follow. We need to re-explore ourselves, dig deeper. I explained how we struggled culturally to use the image to export. So if I could summarize, this is this is this is what we really need to do. Re-explore yourself, do not copy. It would take time. We're a core state. We need to control. It's our our responsibility to to manage our sphere of influence. And let's make peace with the bombardment that comes from other core states. Mm -hmm. Wallahi, um, Mr. Zed, thank you so much. I call you Mr. Zed because there's just so much knowledge that you dropped Appreciate on me. It. I mean, it, it was an incredibly Appreciate rich, uh, engaging and beneficial Appreciate episode. It. Honestly, very much enjoyed it. Uh, one that I think I'll be watching many, many times while taking notes. Um, is uh, Did we cover everything? Is there something that you feel that uh, we did not the, touch there's, on? There's a lot to say, there's, but I think this is would be sufficient. For, for your first time on the Mo Show <laughs> podcast. Appreciate it. Well, I, I really appreciate it. I think, you know, that the media world is um, can be fickle to some, uh, can be educational for others. There's, there's just so much information out there. and uh, And just to hear your perspective on it. Uh, where we stand, where we were, where we are today, and where we're going to go is uh, is information that I think many people can benefit from. So thank you so much for sharing you. your wealth of knowledge you. with me. Thank you. Appreciate it. And um, yeah, so that covers your first episode on The Mo Show. Appreciate Until it. Until next time around. Thank you very thank much. Thank you so much for your time. Take Appreciate it. Thank Shukran. you.